The Black Arrow by Robert Louis Stevenson Book One, Chapter Four A Greenwood Company Matcham was well rested and revived, and the two lads, winged by what Dick had seen, hurried through the remainder of the outwood, crossed the road in safety, and began to mount into the high ground of Tunstall Forest. The trees grew more and more in groves, with heathy places in between, sandy, gorsy, and dotted with old yews. The ground became more and more uneven, full of pits and hillocks, and with every step of the ascent the wind still blew the shriller, and the trees bent before the gusts like fishing-rods. They had just entered one of the clearings, when Dick suddenly clapped down upon his face among the brambles, and began to crawl slowly backward towards the shelter of the grove. Matcham, in great bewilderment, for he could see no reason for this flight, still imitated his companion's course, and it was not until they had gained the harbour of a thicket that he turned and begged him to explain. For all reply, Dick pointed with his finger. At the far end of the clearing, a fir grew high above the neighbouring wood, and planted its black shock of foliage clear against the sky. For about fifty feet above the ground the trunk grew straight and solid like a column. At that level it split into two massive boughs, and in the fork, like a mast-headed seaman, there stood a man in a green tabard, spying far and wide. The sun glistened upon his hair. With one hand he shaded his eyes to look abroad, and he kept slowly rolling his head from side to side, with the regularity of a machine. The lads exchanged glances. "'Let us try to the left,' said Dick. "'We have near fallen foully, Jack.' Ten minutes afterwards they struck into a beaten path. "'Here is a piece of forest that I know not,' Dick remarked. "'Where goeth me this track?' "'Let us even try,' said Matcham. A few yards further the path came to the top of a ridge, and began to go down abruptly into a cup-shaped hollow. At the foot, out of a thick wood of flowering hawthorn, two or three roofless gables, blackened as if by fire, and a single tall chimney marked the ruins of a house. "'What may this be?' whispered Matcham. "'Nay, by the mass, I know not,' answered Dick. "'I am all at sea. Let us go warily.' With beating hearts they descended through the hawthorns. Here and there they passed signs of recent cultivation. Fruit-trees and pot-herbs ran wild among the thicket. A sundial had fallen in the grass. It seemed they were treading what once had been a garden." yet a little farther, and they came forth before the ruins of the house. It had been a pleasant mansion and a strong. A dry ditch was dug deep about it, but it was now choked with masonry, and bridged by a fallen rafter. The two farther walls still stood, the sun shining through their empty windows, but the remainder of the building had collapsed, and now lay in a great carn of ruin, grimed with fire. Already in the interior a few plants were springing green among the chinks. "'Now I bethink me,' whispered Dick, "'this must be Grimstone. It was a hold of one Simon Malmesbury. Sir Daniel was his bane. Twas Bennet Hatch that burned it, now five years agone. In sooth twas pity, for it was a fair house.' Down in the hollow, where no wind blew, it was both warm and still, and Matcham, laying one hand upon Dick's arm, held up a warning finger. Hist! he said. There came a strange sound, breaking on the quiet. It was twice repeated ere they recognized its nature. It was the sound of a big man clearing his throat, and just then a hoarse, untuneful voice broke into singing. Then up and spake the master, the king of the outlaws. What make ye here a merry men among the greenwood shaws? And Camel in made answer, he never looked a down. Oh, they must need to walk in wood that may not walk in town. 
The singer paused, a faint clink of iron followed, and then silence. The two lads stood looking at each other. Whoever he might be, their invisible neighbour was just beyond the ruin and suddenly the colour came into Matcham's face, and next moment he had crossed the fallen rafter, and was climbing cautiously on the huge pile of lumber that filled the interior of the roofless house. Dick would have withheld him, had he been in time. As it was, he was fain to follow. Right in the corner of the ruin two rafters had fallen crosswise, and protected a clear space no larger than a pew in church. Into this the lads silently lowered themselves. There they were perfectly concealed, and through an arrow loophole commanded a view upon the farther side. Peering through this they were struck stiff with terror at their predicament. To retreat was impossible. They scarce dared to breathe. Upon the very margin of the ditch, not thirty feet from where they crouched, an iron cauldron bubbled and steamed above a glowing fire, and close by, in an attitude of listening, as though he had caught some sound of their clamouring among the ruins, a tall, red-faced, battered-looking man stood poised, an iron spoon in his right hand, a horn and a formidable dagger at his belt. Plainly this was the singer. Plainly he had been stirring the cauldron, when some incautious step among the lumber had fallen upon his ear. A little further off another man lay slumbering, rolled in a brown cloak, with a butterfly hovering above his face. All this was in a clearing white with daisies, and at the extreme verge a bow, a sheaf of arrows, and part of a deer's carcass hung upon a flowering hawthorn. Presently the fellow relaxed from his attitude of attention, raised the spoon to his mouth, tasted its contents, nodded, and then fell again to stirring and singing. "'Oh, they must need to walk in wood that may not walk in town,' he croaked, taking up his song where he had left it. "'Oh, sir, we walk not here at all an evil thing to do, but if we meet with a good king's dear to shoot a shaft in two. Still as he sang, he took from time to time another spoonful of the broth, blew upon it, and tasted it, with all the airs of an experienced cook. At length, apparently, he judged the mess was ready, for taking the horn from his girdle, he blew three modulated calls. The other fellow awoke, rolled over, brushed away the butterfly, and looked about him. "'How now, brother?' he said. "'Dinner?' "'I saw it,' replied the cook. "'Dinner it is, and a dry dinner, too, with neither ale nor bread. But there is little pleasure in the green wood now. Time was when a good fellow could live here like a mitred abbot, set aside the rain and the white frosts. He had his heart's desire both of ale and wine. But now are men's spirits dead, and this John Amendall, save us and guard us, but a stuffed booby to scare crows withal. Nay, returned the other, ye are too set on meat and drinking, lawless. Bide ye a bit, the good time cometh. Look ye, returned the cook, I have even waited for this good time, sith that I was so high. I have been a grey friar, I have been a king's archer. I have been a shipman, and sailed the salt seas, and I have been in Greenwood before this, forsooth, and shot the king's deer. <laughs> what cometh of it? Naught! I were better to have bided in the cloister. John Abbot availeth more than John Amendall. By her lady, here they come! One after another, tall, likely fellows began to stroll into the lawn. Each as he came produced a knife and a horn cup, helped himself from the cauldron, and sat down upon the grass to eat. They were very variously equipped and armed, some in rusty smocks, and with nothing but a knife and an old bow. Others in the height of forest gallantry, all in Lincoln green, both hood and jerkin, with dainty peacock arrows in their belts, a horn upon a baldric, and a sword and dagger at their sides. 
They came in the silence of hunger, and scarce growled a salutation, but fell instantly to meet. There were, perhaps, a score of them already gathered, when a sound of suppressed cheering arose close by among the hawthorns, and immediately after five or six woodmen carrying a stretcher debouched upon the lawn. A tall, lusty fellow, somewhat grizzled, and as brown as a smoked ham, walked before them with an air of some authority, his bow at his back, a bright boar-spear in his hand. "'Lads!' he cried. "'Good fellows all, and my right merry friends! Ye have sung this while on a dry whistle, and lived at little ease. But what said I ever? Abide fortune constantly, she turneth, turneth swift, and, lo, here is her little firstling, even that good creature, ale!' There was a murmur of applause as the bear set down the stretcher, and displayed a goodly cask. "'And now haste ye, boys,' the man continued, "'there is work toward. A handful of archers are but now come to the ferry. Muri and Blue is their wear. They are our butts. They shall all taste arrows. No man of them shall struggle through this wood. Four lads, we are here some fifty strong, each man of us most foully wronged, for some they have lost lands, and some friends, and some they have been outlawed, all oppressed. Who, then, hath done this evil? Sir Daniel, by the rood! Shall he, then, profit? Shall he sit snug in our houses? Shall he till our fields? Shall he suck the bone he robbed us of? I trow not. He getteth him strength at law, he gaineth cases. Nay, there is one case he shall not gain. I have a writ here at my belt that, please the saints, shall conquer him. Lawless the cook was by this time already at his second horn of ale. He raised it as if to pledge the speaker. "'Master Ellis,' he said, "'ye are for vengeance. Well, it becometh ye. But your poor brother of the greenwood, that had never lands to lose nor friends to think upon, looketh rather for his poor part to the profit of the thing. He had lever a gold noble and a pottle of canary wine than all the vengeances in purgatory. "'Lawless,' replied the other, "'to reach the moat-house Sir Daniel must pass the forest. We shall make that passage dearer, party, than any battle. Then, when he hath got to earth with such ragged handful as escapeth us, all his great friends fallen and fled away, and none to give him aid. We shall beleaguer that old fox about, and great shall be the fall of him. Tis a fat buck. He will make a dinner for us all. I, returned Lawless, I have eaten many of these dinners beforehand, but the cooking of them is hot work, good Master Ellis. And meanwhile, what do we? We make black arrows, we write rhymes, and we drink fair cold water, that discomfortable drink. You're untrue, Will Lawless. You still smell of the Greyfriars' buttery. Greed is your undoing, answered Ellis. We took twenty pounds from Apple Yard. We took seven marks from the messenger last night. A day ago we had fifty from the merchant. And today said one of the men, "'I stopped a fat pardoner riding a pace for Holywood. Here is his purse.' Ellis counted the contents. Five score shillings,' he grumbled. "'Fool, he had more in his sandal, or stitched into his tippet. Ye are but a child, Tom Cacao. Ye have lost the fish.' But for all that, Ellis pocketed the purse with nonchalance. He stood leaning on his boar-spear, and looked round upon the rest. They, in various attitudes, took greedily of the venison pottage, and liberally washed it down with ale. This was a good day. They were in luck, but business pressed, and they were speedy in their eating. The first comers had by this time even dispatched their dinner. Some lay down upon the grass, and fell instantly asleep, like boa constrictors. Others talked together, 
or overhauled their weapons, and one, whose humour was particularly gay, holding forth an ale-horn, began to sing. "'Here is no law in good green shaw, here is no lack of meat. Tis merry and quiet with deer for our diet in summer when all is sweet. Come winter again with wind and rain, come winter with snow and sleet. Get home to your places with hoods on your faces, and sit by the fire and eat. All this while the two lads had listened and lain close. Only Richard had unslung his crossbow, and held ready in one hand the windac, or grappling iron that he used to bend it. Otherwise they had not dared to stir, and this scene of forest life had gone on before their eyes like a scene upon a theatre. But now there came a strange interruption. The tall chimney which overtopped the remainder of the ruins rose right above their hiding-place. There came a whistle in the air, and then a resounding smack, and the fragments of a broken arrow fell about their ears. Some one from the upper quarters of the wood, perhaps the very sentinel they saw posted in the fir, had shot an arrow at the chimney-top. Matcham could not restrain a little cry, which he instantly stifled, and even Dick started with surprise, and dropped the wind from his fingers. But to the fellows on the lawn this shaft was an expected signal. They were all afoot together, tightening their belts, testing their bowstrings, loosening sword and dagger in the sheath. Ellis held up his hand. His face had suddenly assumed a look of savage energy. The white of his eyes shone in his sun-brown face. "'Ads,' he said, "'you know your places. Let not one man's soul escape you. Appleyard was a wet before a meal. But now we go to table. I have three men whom I will bitterly avenge. Harry Shelton, Simon Malmesbury, and—' striking his broad bosom— and Ellis Duckworth by the mass. Another man came, red with hurry, through the thorns. "'Tis not Sir Daniel,' he panted. "'They are but seven. Is the arrow gone?' "'It struck but now,' replied Ellis. "'A murrain!' cried the messenger. "'Methought I heard it whistle, and I go dinnerless.' In the space of a minute, some running, some walking sharply, according to their stations, were nearer or farther away, the men of the Black Arrow had all disappeared from the neighbourhood of the ruined house, and the cauldron and the fire, which was now burning low, and the dead deer's carcass on the hawthorn, remained alone to testify they had been there. End of chapter